Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Shadow Fire Promotions Podcast. This is week two. I want to start off by thanking everyone who listened to, downloaded, streamed, or shared, or anything else, our first podcast. It really does mean a lot to me. My name is Greg Dennis. I am your host. I am the president of Shadow Fire Promotions, your Chicago source for wrestling. Before I begin, I want to give a few special shout-outs to people who have helped along the way. My good friend Nicholas Wadier of Wadier Entertainment and Technopoly 411. Technopoly 411 is for anything technical. Nick is just a complete tech head and absolute genius with anything technical. Nick helped me out a lot in helping me get my first podcast up, helping me out a little bit with the uh, sfpinkchicago.com page, a couple of pages there, and we've officially made Technopoly Fallen 1 uh, and the Technopoly 411 podcast an official tech partner of Shadowfire Promotions. So special shout-out, special thanks to Nick. Uh, there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of uh, technical aspects of this broadcast, this podcast that Nick is helping out with. But I wanted to go and get a second podcast up because there's just a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about. So if you'll hang with us, we do have a few groin pains going on. You just stick with us. This is going to be kind of an experiment. Uh, technically, I don't have all sorts of wonderful tools that will do this stuff for me. This is all self-done. So, you know, if you need any help with anything, definitely check out our page, sfpinkchicago.com. That is SFP, like Shadow Fire Promotions, I-N-C, chicago.com. Click on the link that says Affiliates and Links. You will find Technopoly 411. Click there. Email them. Listen to their podcast. If you have anything that you are trying to do in the wonderful, wacky world of tech, Nicholas Wadier is your man. He is the man for all sorts of things technology. Also, special shout-out to Crosswinds.net. Crosswinds.net, they're my web hosts. They're the people that bring you SFPInkChicago.com. They're a great partner to have. Anything that you need, there's they're definitely the personal touch in terms of customer service. You email Jen and Tony. They're always there keeping you on top of everything that's going on. It's a super great place to have a host. Uh, I've been hosting my site there for, oh, probably 12 years or so. So they're really great, great great place to be. Wouldn't, wouldn't dream of going elsewhere. Great service, unlimited bandwidth, unlimited uh, uh, space for your files. They've been super generous uh, with helping me out and everything, especially in the first couple of days of the website when I built it way back in, you know, 98, 2000. Uh, so they're, they're really great uh, people to host your website with. So I would definitely recommend if you have a website or want to build a website, definitely check them out. Our first thing is uh, in memoriam for Ox Baker. Ox Baker, I like to hurt people. Yes, Ox Baker. Ox just died a couple of days ago at age 80. Jerry Lawler broke the news on Twitter that his pal Ox Baker had died. WWE on their site had made mention of him. Uh, he lived till 80. In the days of the territories, I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, in the days of the territories, Ox Baker was probably one of the most feared rule breakers inside the ring. He's about six foot five, about 240 pounds or so. Huge guy, real intimidating appearance, big bald head, big bushy mustache, and he's got the those Ming the Merciless eyebrows where he goes and kind of did it like a Vulcan, where he kind of put them so the eyebrows are kind of shaped and formed, little kind of upwards pointing. Uh, just a huge guy and and pretty pretty fearsome guy at, at you know his height and his weight and uh, you know I think when you look back at wrestling you're gonna look at someone like Ox and and talk about whether um, someone is truly a legend or not and I think Ox Baker definitely is he was he's won championships all over the world never quite was you know, the, the big champion, wasn't the NWA world champion, wasn't quite the World Wrestling Federation champion, um, but he definitely held a lot of regional championships all over. 
he admits he wasn't really a great wrestler, but he was a heck of a talker, and that's what got him uh, his reputation. That's what got him into the game, so to speak. You know, and the you know wrestling really has not changed all that much from the modern era. You know, into the old days of the '60s and '70s, still had to be able to talk uh, the crowd into the arenas, just like you do for the modern day. Uh, Baker also worked. Uh, he starred as a slag in a scene with uh, Kurt Russell from John Carpenter's film Escape from New York. He was in the wrestling documentary I Like to Hurt People. Uh, I like her appeal. It features Ox, but it's mainly based on its documentary. It's mainly based on the original Sheik, the Detroit Sheik at Farhat. Uh, some people know him by his real name. Uh, that's a good documentary. We have it in our personal library. We have it available to sell. So if you're interested in that, hit us up. You know, let us know. Um, we'll have a full career retrospective of Ox Baker up on our Facebook page very shortly. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Chicago. Our Twitter, twitter.com slash Chicago. You can find me, Greg Dennis. You can find me on LinkedIn. I am only on LinkedIn. So everything else is the corporation. If you have any comments, suggestions, questions, or anything regarding this podcast and only this podcast, submit your questions to podcast at sfpincchicago.com. That is only for podcast questions. If you have questions about ordering merchandise or anything else, direct them to orders at sfpincchicago.com. If you are a wrestler or a mixed martial arts fighter or if you're an MMA promotion, mixed martial arts uh, MMA promotion or a pro wrestling company and you're interested in entering into an agreement for Shadowfire Promotions to distribute merchandise, uh, you can send us an email at distribution at sfpincchicago.com and ask questions there. There's also a page up on uh, sfpincchicago.com. If you look there, it says let SFP distribute your merchandise. Click there to give you about 99.9% .9 of the details you're going to need. Uh, so, let's go and start off this week. There's a lot of stuff going on, so uh, let's get right to it. Uh, first off, let's talk about the WWE Network. Uh, there was recently an article in the Street newspaper. I caught wind of this when I was looking at WWE stock uh, not too long ago, a couple of days back. And this is from Tuesday, the 21st, where uh, Nathaniel August, who... I don't know who this guy is, but he is the founder of a hedge fund, Mangrove Partners. So he's apparently an investment guru. He's the founder of the hedge fund, Mangrove Partners. And a hedge fund, for those who are not savvy with investments or investment terminology, a hedge fund is an investment vehicle that pools money from all the different investors that invest into, into your firm. And they take that money and they go and invest all your money into various different types of securities, like stocks, like uh, other types of things. So basically, if you and 10 other guys get together and you give money to me, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to invest in all sorts of other different securities and commodities to go and try and generate revenue for you. Uh, if you want more information, I suggest you either go and look it up on Wikipedia or you go and talk to a financial attorney. If you're interested, I can certainly recommend you to a great financial attorney. Uh, we use them for all of our issues with funds and investments and such. So uh, let me know. You can direct an email to orders at sfpinkchicago.com or podcast at sfpinkchicago.com uh, with questions about securities and hedge funds and that. And I'm sure that I can go and have my attorney go and break it down Barney style for you if you're really into that type of thing. Most people don't have the type of money to be investing in hedge funds because they're very high risk kind of investments. So you really have to have a lot of money to burn to, to do that because of the type of risk factor involved. Uh, that said, high risk, high gain. So if you have the type of money to invest, in those types of things, there's great rewards. There's great returns on those rewards. Uh, there's great rewards on those returns, rather. 
Uh, so yeah, if you have a lot of money and you want to go and invest in that type of thing, definitely look into it. I'm not a financial planner. I am not the type of person that you want to be sitting there and asking all sorts of questions about it. I will do my best to go and if you're really truly interested, I'll talk to my attorney for investments and see if he can help you out. But I think you'd be better off going to an Edward R. Jones or something like that for help if you have the type of money and you want to start investing. Because the bottom line is we are a pro wrestling media distribution company and we're not an investment company, so we can't help you out with any of that type of thing. Anyhow, back to the story. Mr. August had said in an interview with CNBC that, quote, nearly all of WWE's future profit profitability, excuse me, quote, relies on the WWE network and the company would, quote, earn nothing at a corporate level, end quote, based on current subscribers and that the WWE would have to double their subscribers to justify their current stock valuation. Well, needless to say, an announcement like that just doesn't go out to the public and nothing happens. So shortly after that announcement, WB stock dropped nearly 5%. Uh, so that's not good. It didn't help WWE stock situation any. It certainly didn't help Vince McMahon any. Um, and here's an interesting thing. Now, based on what Mr. August has said in his interview, based on those that little snippet of a quote, and I didn't look at the entire interview, if it's in print or anything, I just looked at the summary from the street newspaper, but if he's saying that they're going to have to double their subscribers, assuming that they have roughly 70 to 80,000 subscribers as of right now, and WWE is about to come out with their newest network subscription numbers when they issue their newest financial report in a handful of days, we're talking that's going to be about 150 to 160,000 subscribers to the WWE network. Vince McMahon himself has estimated that in order to stay profitable with the network, he's looking for about 100,000 subscribers. So the big question is going to be, can WWE and the WWE Network go and manage to get that many subscribers? Uh, and, and this is something that I wanted to discuss, you know, in terms of doubling their, um, their, their subscription numbers. Because I don't think, judging from what I've seen about the network, it does not seem that they're doing the world's best job of monetizing their content. They have their cartoon show, WB Slam City, is going to be on Nickelodeon. Uh, so there's basic cable right there. And, but I'm not sure between Total Divas on E!, and WB Slam City and all these other different things. I'm not sure if WB is really doing the best they can to monetize their library, whether it be pay-per-view or anything else. And the reason I say this, I understand the basics of the business that, okay, the pay-per-views definitely generate a lot more revenue than DVD sales, so it's understandable why WWE is not going and putting out as many DVDs as they do with content on the network. But right now, it would seem the content on the network is really kind of limited, and I'm not sure if WWE fully has digitized every uh, bit of contest, uh, content rather on that they own, so that's going to be a little difficult in providing content. And, and something else that to think about when we talk about content on the network is you have to be able to convince people to part with their 60 bucks every six months and continue to do such, you know, every six months. You know, once they have your, your six-month commitment, now it's not a matter of, okay, well, we don't need to worry about Joe because he's already subscribed for six months. Let's try for Jim. They have to be able to provide enough content so that everyone that's already given you their uh, $60 is going to want to renew at that end of the six months, whether it be WrestleMania season or SummerSlam or one of the other big pay-per-views that they have. They still need to be able to provide something to convince people to stay with the network. And that's going to be very hard because with a pay-per-view every calendar month, that really does not give 
WWE that much time in between Raw shows and SmackDown shows and anything else that they have to really build up enough content for uh, the pay-per-views that are showing. You know, they'd be, obviously, from a business perspective, again, Vince McMahon, the chairman of WWE, is much more interested in having more money, so it makes more sense on the surface, on the surface, to say, well, more pay-per-views is going to equal more money. But he would probably be better served to cut back on the amount of pay-per-views he has in order to make each pay-per-view event actually be a, a can't-miss kind of event and thus generate more buys rather than having 10 pay-per-views or 12 or 14 pay-per-views a year and not getting that many buys if he went and cut back from, say, 14 to 10 or even slashing it in half and doing seven. It, this would never happen, by the way. But if he were to do something like that and say, okay, I'm going to make... I'm going to build up each pay-per-view even better because now I don't have to worry about a pay-per-view every month. If I did one every other month, I could have more time to build up these pay-per-views on television and make it seem to be a bigger event each time I run one as opposed to saying, well, I've got to pay for this month, so what am I going to throw together? And, hey, this is a hell in a cell, so I've got to make sure that whatever it is that's happening in that cell hey, this is, you know, whatever pay-per-view that fits in this theme, so everything's got to fit in this theme. And I touched on this last week's podcast where I discussed how WWE seems to be at the frame of mind of, hey, we're just going to throw out whatever matches that are there. And it also goes in that same vein that you really want to be able to have you know, each pay-per-view match means something and not just put them out there because if people get the impression that, hey, it's just time that, you know, we want another 50 bucks on pay-per-view or we don't care because we've got your 60 bucks for the six months in the network, WWE is going to find very soon that they're not going to be able to sustain their numbers. This was something that was kind of touched upon a while back before this podcast that WWE does not always do the best job they can in building up their pay-per-views and making each pay-per-view seem like this is a can't-miss kind of thing. And until and unless they can do that, until they can make the stories behind each wrestling match on their pay-per-views be a really important event, they're going to continue to have problems. You know, WWE's solution to... Uh, falling pay-per-view buys is saying, well, hey, we'll make it up by jacking up the price of each pay-per-view. So it went from $29.95 to $34.95 to $39.95 to, you know, now we're at, what, $54.95? Uh, so you're asking people to be giving up a lot of money, and the buy rates, you're making up saying, okay, well, we'll sell less stuff, but we'll just raise the price of everything else. So it'll meet halfway in the middle, instead of looking at it and saying, gee, is our storytelling not that great? Should we should we be considering writing better stories behind the matches to make each pay-per-view mean something a little more in order to make more money? And I don't think, I think they're kind of doing what the old cliche about penny wise, pound foolish, or in more simple terms, they're just looking at the short term and saying, well, if we get more money off of each one, then it really doesn't matter if we tell bad stories. And there's always going to be someone that's going to buy each event just because. So for that for that segment of the audience, the segment of the audience that says, well, hey, if it's WWE, I'm buying it. It doesn't matter. So they, they have those. They have that section of the audience. Whether they do something with it, it's a whole different thing. They really should. They should really do better. Um, more WWE stuff. I know a lot of this is WWE, but there's always so much going on with WWE. It's very hard to not talk a lot about them. A uh, little, little bit that I discussed last podcast, there's a lot of acronyms in pro wrestling. I'm going to try my best to make sure that I explain and elaborate each 
uh, acronym before it's used. So if you listen to this podcast from beginning to end, you can say, oh, he explained what that is. Because wrestling is just like anywhere else where we've got our own terminology, our own language, and everything like that. And if you're a first-time uh, listener to this podcast, or if you're not from the pro wrestling world, you might be looking at it and saying, oh, gee, I don't know what this is, and be turned off as a result by this and not want to listen to future episodes if you feel like, hey, I'm being left out because I don't understand some of these terminologies. Uh, before I go into the rest of my thoughts on Deb Gabi, I'm just going to go and briefly touch on something that is kind of a long-term pet peeve, is the so-called shoot interview. And what that is for people that are not informed, it's basically uh, companies that specialize in uh, having interviews, usually with retired wrestlers, and they're unscripted, and they just ask you a bunch of questions, and you're kind of encouraged to talk as much shit as you possibly can about whatever. And they kind of market these for people that are interested in gossip and dirt. It's kind of like Us Magazine for pro wrestling or, or the National Enquirer or something like that, or People, or any of these other kind of gossip rags where, you know, you're encouraged to talk and tell stories and stuff. They've ne- it's never really been a big... I've never really been a big fan of it. I know there are some people that are. I've never really been a big fan of it for a bunch of reasons. First off, because if you're having a video series where all you're doing is interviewing the guy and the guy is one person on camera, there's really no reason to do a video of it. This is the type of thing that you could go and do an audio only. You know, we're not going to feature a video of this podcast because there's no point because you really don't want to be staring at one person just talking to the microphone for an hour. There's nothing visually enhancing about it that it deserves to be made into a video. And the second thing is that typically these videos are very low quality. Really, I mean, the, the lowest quality you can think of, these things are. They're, they're pretty low quality. And, and the people that produce them ask for a lot of money for a low quality video in the hopes of people interested in hearing dirt uh, will pick them up and justify whatever the cost to that producing company is that they had to pay to the wrestler to do this. And one of the other things as a pet peeve uh, is because of our business model where we sell only original media, we don't do bootlegs of any kind, everything we have comes directly from a wrestling federation or a wrestler. And it's, it's you know, when it comes from the wrestling federation or the wrestler, it's all self-produced. So there's no copyright issues. But a lot of these shoot interviews will feature plenty of bootleg matches and stuff that they just copy from other places and throw it on there in the hopes of filling up space on their tape. So that's that's the thing with shoot interviews. And plus the other thing is really, if you want to go and hang out and listen to old stories and stuff, you should really consider just going on the road and talking with these people. You know, find out if... Wrestler X or Wrestler Y is going to be either at a public appearance or a match somewhere or something else where you can find this guy and talk to him. It's the same thing that actors do. You know, uh, my, so a lot of my friends, we talked about Shannon Shea Marie last podcast and her play. I'm going to give a plug to her in a minute anyway. But it's a very similar thing where you don't want to sit there and read magazines. Go find these people and talk to them and pick their brain. Don't be recording up with a whole lot of bootleg footage and saying, hey, look at this. It, it just doesn't seem like a it doesn't seem like a really great way to, to cut down on bootleg media in professional wrestling or mixed martial arts and to sit there and listen to people be talking trash about other wrestlers or other promoters is the other thing that just doesn't really seem to be that great a thing. You know, that, that uh, it just doesn't really, you know, it's not your original content. You're, you're selling it based on an interview, a video based on an interview, and then a whole lot of bootleg media to take up time. So that's just a minor rant uh, for anyone who actually likes doing these things, like watching these videos. I would suggest going out to the matches and find these guys and talk to them yourself rather than listening to shoot interviews and giving money to people that really don't care. Um... Back to the WWE 
recently I heard news that there was a deal brokered by Jim Ross, uh, broadcaster Jim Ross, before he left WWE. He had apparently made some type of deal with the NFL's Players Union uh, to bring ex-football players to WWE. And the first thing that crossed my mind is, okay, these football players are going to come through the WWE uh, um, training facility. Um, I forget what the, what the WWE Performance Center. And the first thing that it reminded me of is how much it sounds a lot like the Diva Search, where we're going to get all these untrained models, but then they're going to look good. They may not be able to wrestle a lick, but they're going to look awesome standing there. They're great in a bikini. It's a lot like... Uh, the ex-wrestler, in quotes, ex, the, the diva Kelly Kelly, where she admitted that she had no idea what WWE was or anything, but hey, their executive vice president found her in a lingerie catalog and thought she'd be a great fit for the organization. And the reason that comes up is because it just seems to follow the WWE mantra of anyone but a wrestler. We will take anyone. We'll take catalog models. We'll take football players. As long as you're not a wrestler, because we don't want a wrestler in our wrestling show. We want someone else. So, okay. I'm not sure if that's more of an insult to the wrestlers or not when you have guys who come up through the ladder and are saying, hey, you know, I've trained to do this. This is, this is what I've trained to do my entire life. And then some guy who's a football player or a basketball player or something gets to come in just because he's made his name elsewhere and kind of get ahead of the line uh, just because he's made his name somewhere else. But he's not a great wrestler. He just happens to be some guy. It's, it's like the celebrities in wrestling, which I talked about last week. Um, Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes, the, the uh, half-brother of Dustin Rhodes, Gold Dust. He is an actor having a variety of different uh, gimmicks in WWE. He is now wrestling as part of the tag team, the Dust Brothers, with his uh, half-brother, Dustin Rhodes, Gold Dust, and now Cody is Stardust, and he wears a similar makeup and costume to what uh, Dustin's wearing. So my question is, is Stardust really the best use for Cody Rhodes. Couldn't Cody Rhodes be doing something better in WWE? It seems like the gimmick is so limiting for him. Goldust was a good character during the so-called Attitude Era of WWE because his character fit the profile of that time of being outlandish and edgy and everything. But I'm not necessarily sure that Stardust is the best use of Cody Rhodes. Uh, some other minor pet peeves um, in WWE. I'm not quite sure if, you know, this kind of goes back to anyone but a wrestler. Um, it's not the same thing, but it's kind of similar, where we talk about the entertainment in a wrestling match and how we have to have outlandish things in a wrestling show, whether it be the hosts of the Today Show or some other actor plugging stuff to come on the show and either engage in a wrestling match or have some sort of interaction with the WWE superstars or something else. And it just seems a little silly to say, oh, you know, this is a sport. We need, like, extra entertainment because the athletic exhibition just isn't entertaining enough. So we need something to, to make it more entertaining. And it seems, again, that a, a little tone deaf on the part of Vince McMahon that just because he thinks that no one wants to see a wrestling match, that no one else does. And, and the thing that comes to me, the first thing that comes to mind with that is Adam Rose and the Bunny, where we have basically a life-size rabbit coming and doing the, these matches. It just seems a little silly. Um... And so a similar thing with, with, um, with that. My question is, um, when you have run-ins of any sort or distractions during a match, is it really necessary to play the guy's entrance music before he runs in? I understand the point of having the entrance music, but it kind of takes away sort of the surprise factor. If you're in the match and you have to pretend that you don't know this guy is coming at you, even though you heard his music... 
it seems just a little silly and overly scripted. You know, how much of a surprise run-in is it going to be if you have enough time to play his music beforehand and, and, and have a few minutes or a few seconds to make sure that everyone knows that's this wrestler's music before you go and have him run in. And on a similar note to run-ins, uh, wrestler distractions during a match where you're, you're, the music is playing, this is almost the same thing, when his music is playing and all of a sudden you're stopping in the middle of a match to go and look at the entrance to someone and say, yeah, come on, come on, come on out, I'll take you on, come on out. It seems so silly. You're just going to turn your back on the guy that you're wrestling because another guy is coming. Are you so easily distracted? It seems a little silly. It seems like one of those things where, you know, you're suspending your disbelief, again, in a wrestling sense um, because it just seems silly that you're going to go and completely ignore the guy that you're wrestling with just because someone else's entrance music played. It seems a little, again, it seems a little tone deaf. So, the next thing I want to talk about in WWE is I was wondering what you, what everyone listening would think about a return to what is called a squash match. And for those who don't know, in the 1980s, when the World Wrestling Federation was first on television, they'd have a lot of shows on Saturdays, a lot of syndicated shows before Monday Night Raw, before SmackDown. They'd have a lot of syndicated shows. And what it would feature is it would have one top star against one preliminary guy or a journeyman kind of guy, lower card guy. And basically it would be a way for the upper card talent to show how dominant he was, show off his finishing move, where he'd pretty much take out the lower card guy in a few minutes without any real trouble. And they would be called a squash match. And those kind of went by the wayside uh, in in the late 1990s when the World Wrestling Federation was embroiled in what was called the Monday Night Wars when Ted Turner's World Championship Wrestling, or WCW, started running their show, Nitro, head-to-head with the then World Wrestling Federation, or WWF, show Raw. And they would kind of up the ante, if you will, by going and putting on more main event style matches uh, when Raw was still doing kind of squash matches or lower card matches or nothing really big. But when they wanted to start getting ratings and be the highest rated show on cable, they started giving away basically pay-per-view style main events. And even to this day, you're going to find a lot of main events on pay-per-view that are identical to the same types of matches that you probably saw on WWE television not too long ago. So that's the big question. Could WWE go back to doing squash matches, or is it all about now doing these main event style matches and being the highest rated show on cable? Um, I understand that the idea is to get the most money for their shows, and especially when they're a publicly traded company, that's really important, but part of the reason why their pay-per-views might not be getting a lot of buys is because people see the same matches over and over and over again on weekly television and are not really inclined to be spending $50 to see the same matches over and over again on pay-per-view that they already saw for free for three weeks straight on television. So that that's a question. You can direct your thoughts on that either to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Chicago. Or if you want to go and be talking about it on the air, you can go and send to podcast at sfpinkchicago.com, and we'll go and gather up your responses, and we'll go and tell, talk about it in our next podcast. Something else uh, regarding matches on WWE. Uh, is, it, is it difficult in, in the new PG WWE where everything has to be very safe and sanitized for their stockholders, is it more difficult now to get um, to get a reaction as a rule breaker when everything has to be ultra sanitary and you have to apply, oh my gosh, you know, we destroyed the Russian flag. Yes, you know, this guy is a hated rule breaker, but I'm so sorry that I had to destroy your flag. That really was uncalled for. 
if we have to apologize for everything that we do and the rule breakers can't really be vile villains, they can't be evil guys that you want to see get their butt handed to them by your fan favorite on the next pay-per-view or anything like that, um, is it something where um, you want to go and have, you know, uh, is it difficult to get that kind of heat on you as as rule breaker? Can you be a truly vile, evil guy if you're in a PG kind of an environment? Uh, so so send your thoughts again to podcast at sfpinkchicago.com, and we'll talk about that in a future edition. So the next thing I want to go and talk about is there is apparently a new wrestling company starting. It's called Lucha Underground. It's set to debut uh, in a handful of days, on the 29th, and it's going to be on the El Rey Network. I don't know a lot about what it is. It's supposed to, The El Rey Network is supposed to be a channel dedicated to second and third generation Latino Americans, people that have been in the country, so, you know, born in this country, so they might not have as much of a connection with the lucha style of wrestling, uh, the Mexican style of professional wrestling, featuring you no know, colorful masks, a lot more in-ring action, that type of thing. Uh, it's supposed to be a different kind of program. From my understanding, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on the in-ring product, a lot less emphasis on the roving camera backstage, uh, that kind of a thing. So, um, like I said, I don't know much about it. The El Rey Network is a really very minor cable network. I don't know anything about that particular channel other than the fact that it's supposed to go and have a primary uh, appeal to like third, fourth, second generation Latino Americans. Uh, so this is going to be interesting. Maybe they'll, this is supposed to be broken up into seasons with kind of a cliffhanger sort of a thing. So they're talking about doing some storytelling, but they've talked also that it's not going to be something similar to what you have already seen with WWE or total nonstop action, TNA wrestling. Uh, still probably the worst name for a wrestling company, but I'm not going to talk about TNA in this broadcast. What I'd like to talk about is Jeff Jarrett, the founder of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, who left the company a long time ago, uh, appears to be wanting to start a new wrestling company called Global Force Wrestling. There is really nothing known about the company yet at this time. Um, it's unknown if there's going to be television in the U.S. or anything like that, what their talent roster looks like or anything like that, the creative direction of the company. All that stuff is really unknown right now. From what I gather looking it up at Wikipedia, they have a lot of international partners. They've got the AAA promotion in Mexico, uh, Estencia, Estoria y Administración, uh, Emerald Wrestling Promotions in Ireland, New Generation Wrestling in Northern England, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Premier British Wrestling in Scotland, Revolution Pro Wrestling in Southern England, Westside Extreme Wrestling in Germany, World Wrestling Professionals in South Africa, PWA Australia, Wrestle Clash in Australia, Riot City Wrestling in Australia, Explosive Pro Wrestling in Australia, and Impact Pro Wrestling in New Zealand. So there's definitely an Australian presence in this company. It would be very interesting to see if they manage to get television in the U.S. or if they have any DVDs or what they're trying to do, uh, or if they're going to be able to run competition to Total Nonstop Action. And so far, Total Nonstop Action has been doing a lot of a lot of shows overseas, uh, a lot of live tours. That's probably their best way to make money right now. Um, I think they're kind of worn out here in the U.S., but we'll see. We'll see what happens as this company, uh, whether TNA goes and sees an end to their promotion or not. Um, it's you know we'll have to wait till the beginning of 2015 and see what's going on. Um, so not much known there. So with the passing of Ox Baker. Um, 
It was something that, that has been brought up on, on the Facebook page a couple of times in the past, which is the Halls of Fame in wrestling. You have the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. You have the WB Hall of Fame. You had at one point the World Championship Wrestling Hall of Fame. TNA's got their own Hall of Fame. So are there really just too many Halls of Fame in pro wrestling? You know, is it watering down the concept of having a Hall of Fame? And really, are the people in all these Halls of Fame, are they really, quote-unquote, Hall of Fame wrestlers? Or are they just people that are gathering for, uh, you know, some other reason in a Hall of Fame? You know, they have all these people in these Halls of Fame. We're really unknown what these people are doing in a Hall of Fame. So, you know, I think Ox Baker, Ox Baker is definitely a Hall of Fame wrestler in terms of, uh, in terms of certainly his career. You know, I think that absolutely, um, absolutely, he's he's was absolutely like a feared villain. Um, he was he was def not the greatest wrestler, certainly, but you know he was without a doubt someone that would probably be considered legendary just because um, you know he had a great career, long career. He's had someone. He's, he's kind of a common name among wrestling fans. He may not have had a huge mainstream presence, but maybe he has. You know, I really, you really have to talk and see. You know, certainly he did an appearance on a Price is Right in the early 80s. Um, it, but, you know, overall this isn't about Ox. It's about do these people, are there just too many Halls of Fame? That's the big question. Are there too many Halls of Fame in pro wrestling? They've got all these Halls of Fame, and none of it really have any true criteria for how to get in, gain admission to these Halls of Fame. You know, the WWE Hall of Fame has absolutely no uh, uh, set standards to say how you join their Hall of Fame, and a lot of their choices for Hall of Fame inductees seem to be curious, which is putting it lightly. Uh, so, when I talked earlier in this uh, broadcast about WWE monetizing their libraries and uh, discussing about putting some of their events on DVD, and this is going, I think that um, Extreme Championship Wrestling, the, the original brand, uh, you know, they could do really good having some of their shows given the DVD box set, uh, uh, the DVD box set treatment as some of their other, uh, as Ron Smackdown have had. You know, Ron Smackdown have had box sets, so why can't ECW? I think that the WWE still tends to, you know, look at this thing where they don't want any other wrestling company, entertainment company to have more time or more merchandise or more anything than WWE proper does, but they're going to have to get over that mindset because if they're not going to monetize these collections they bought and just say, well, we want to own it just for the sake of saying that we bought out our competition, but we're not actually going to do anything with it. We're going to sit in a can and just let it rot. They're not going to do themselves any favors. And this goes back to the WWE Network where they have to go and be able to monetize the content that they have. And if they were not ready to go and fully launch this network, then they really shouldn't have started it. And that's really the bottom line. You can't start it if you don't have it. You're saying, well, we didn't really create a lot of stuff for it, but, you know, we're, we're going to. We're going to do that. We'll, we'll definitely get to that at some point. Then you really shouldn't do it because this is the type of thing that if you were able to announce what you were having and you're having all this great content and stuff, maybe more people would be interested in joining the network because from the feedback I've seen on our Facebook page, there's not a lot of people that are really super interested in uh, staying with the WWE network for a variety of reasons. And whatever those reasons are, that's a bad thing. If WWE cannot hold on to their subscribers and keep their subscribers interested. So, you know, they should really have, there was a lot of great ECW television, and they could go and put a great DVD box set, you know, four or five discs or something of stuff. You've got Paul Heyman. You've got other guys 
in, in ECW that would probably love to go and get another paycheck to go and talk about ECW. You know, you had the Rise and Fall collection, you had the most extreme matches, you've had a couple others, but they really haven't had the TV and saying, here's the challenges we faced on television and here's some of the great memories of stuff we did on television. They covered a little bit of it in the Rise and Fall set, but they could do so much more. They could really do so much more with uh, with the ECW library and for that matter with all their other libraries too. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is I'd like to go and take this opportunity to review a book. It's not a wrestling book. It comes from my friend K.D. Cormacan. Uh, that's like K.D. Lang, not like K.D. Heigl. K.D., like letters K.D. And the book is called Whatever Makes You Blind. It's a novel. It's her first novel, self-published. Um, I'm not, here's the thing, though. This is going to be a little bit, I'm not going to tell you what the book is, what it's about. Why? Because I don't want you to go and get any preconceived notions about what this book is about. Because the first time that I picked it up, I was like, oh my, what is this going to be like? And then I read it and I was like, wow, I really liked it a lot. It's really easy reading. It's only about 250 pages, I think. Uh, 230, 250. Let me see real quick here. Um, get to the last page here. Yeah, it's about uh, 200, it's just a little over 225 pages. Very, very fast read. Probably get it in a weekend. But it's a really, really good book. You know, I think that people that, that buy it will be pleasantly surprised. You'd be helping out one of our friends, Katie Cormacan. You know, you'd really be helping her out by getting this book. And I'd love to hear, once you're done with the book, tell me your thoughts on the book. Tell me, you know, if your first impression changed after reading the book. Because the characters are really described really well. I thought the characters acted logically. There wasn't something where the characters acted in a way where you kind of feel, oh, no one really ever act like this. You know, no one would ever be like that in real life. No, I felt it was the characters were well written. They were well described. Um, and things like that happened. The, the events that happened in the book are events that could theoretically happen in real life. And I'm sure they have. I probably know a lot of people who that that are could sit there and look at the characters in the book and say, I know someone like that, or I was like that, or something. So I'm not going to go and tell you a lot of details about the book. I just want you to go to Amazon.com. You can pick it up in paperback, or if you're the type that likes a fake book, you can go and get it in Kindle version. Download it to your Kindle. You can follow KD Cormican on Twitter. Her Twitter is Kimberly C74. Uh, that's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y 74. That's her Twitter handle. And if you look her up on Amazon, it's K.D. Cormacan. And the title of the book is Whatever Makes You Blind. It's not Whatever Makes You Go Blind. Make sure that the title is right, Whatever Makes You Blind. It's not a masturbation aid. Whatever Makes You Blind. Um, it's a really good book. I really would suggest picking it up. If, you, if you're a fan of books, if you're a fan of reading and you like to read, definitely pick this book up. I think that you will very much like it. And again, you'll be doing a good favor to another friend of mine. Um, so, Halloween. Halloween is coming up. So, if you have nothing to do on Halloween, and you would like to go and spend some time in sunny Miami, Florida, why don't you go and join my pal Daniel Pewter, the undefeated mixed martial arts fighter, the first $1 million tough enough champion, um, and in an interesting little trivia note, if you look online, uh, if you look on YouTube, you can find Daniel Pewter, a clip of him in Ohio Valley Wrestling, OVW, with a uh, former NWA Wisconsin, former All-Star Championship Wrestling, former WWE, former TNA wrestler, Ken Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, Kamikaze Ken Anderson, Mr. Anderson, whatever name you know him under. But when he first debuted under the name Mr. Kennedy, it was a match with Daniel Pewter. And uh, it's a really funny segment, actually, where Ken is out there and he's introducing Pewter and everything. Um, they don't have the actual match itself up there, but just the, the thing with Mr. Kennedy or Mr. Anderson becoming Mr. Kennedy, it's, it's a really funny clip. But um, So in our last broadcast, I talked about how Daniel Pewter has started up an anti-bullying charity called My Life, My Power. 
and Daniel is in Miami, and he's having uh, a Halloween charity event. It's going to be on November 1st, so you saw a tiny go tricks or treating. Uh, it's at Lock and Load Miami, which is at 2545 North Miami Avenue in Miami, Florida. It's about 6 p.m. till midnight, more or less. Um, and what it is, is you're going to have to go and be able to shoot some weapons. It's going to be a really cool time. Uh, be able to shoot some weapons and stuff, and machine gun shooting range, all sorts of exotic firearms. And it's going to be a very safe thing. You're going to have all, you know, trained law enforcement personnel all supervising the event, teaching you how to use all these weapons and stuff. So it should be a lot of fun. I mean, if you want to go and shoot off some weapons and have a lot of fun in a shooting range, all for charity, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great event. So you can pick up your tickets at the My Life, My Power website. It's mylifemypower.org slash Halloween event. If you're already in Miami, you can go and purchase tickets at the door. Um, there's going to be a dinner at 8 p.m., about 8 to 10. Um, the red carpet is 6 to 7. There's shooting range time from 6.30 to 11. It should be a lot of fun. I hope that Daniel, uh, I hope that Daniel does something out in the Chicagoland area, or if he does something a little sooner, uh, if I get noticed about it a little sooner, I'd love to travel to Miami and shoot off some weapons and go out to sunny little Florida, take a little mini vacation. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, another friend of mine, Shannon Shea Marie, Shannon Marie Williams, she is starring for the second time in the play There Are No Good Men Because There Are No Good Women, Women, excuse me, There Are No Good Men Because There Are No Good Women. It's an adaptation of the book by Lori Hardy. Lori Hardy wrote and directed this play that Shannon is in. The play is on, it's three performances. It's in Naperville, Illinois. It's at the Center Stage Theater. It's 1665 Quincy Avenue in Naperville, Illinois. You can look it on up. Um, and the play times are Friday the 31st of October at 7, November the 1st at 7, and November the 2nd at 3. Uh, so these are all PM times, and you should really go see Shannon. She's a really beautiful girl. She's a terrific actress. She's a lot of fun to be with. And like Kimberly and like Daniel Pewter, they're all part of the Shadowfire Promotions family. So you'd be really helping out these people. So that's, uh, that's about it for this time. I'd like to uh, once again go and thank Nicholas Waudier, Waudier Entertainment, uh, Technopoly 411. Nick has been helping us out with our podcast. He's been doing a lot of tech stuff behind the scenes. He's been helping us with our webpage, sfpinkchicago.com. Um, Go to Technopoly 411. Nick is there for all of your tech needs. He's got a podcast. He knows a lot about podcasts. He knows a lot about cameras. He's just a great guy. Always wanted to help. A lot of knowledge locked up in that head of yours. And he's always wanted to go and share his knowledge. You know, give him a shout out with all your tech questions. He can definitely help you. Our web host, Crosswinds.net, they've been hosting SFPInkChicago.com for the past dozen years or so. They're a great partner. And remember, all these people that, that are getting plugs, you know, Nicholas and, and um, Crosswinds and them, these are not our sponsors. We're not getting paid for any of this stuff. We're just helping out some of our friends. We're helping out some of the people who got us to where we are. We are actively looking for sponsors. It would be awesome to get some sponsorships and uh, have some money rolling in for this. You're going to see as time goes on, we're going to start talking a little more about the different videos that we have, some wrestling stuff, some mainstream movies, uh, maybe some stuff about the WWE studios. So stay tuned for those uh, broadcasts in the future podcast editions. Um, I'd also like to go and plug Cairo One, CairoOne.net. Um, I... I'm a runner. People that know me know I'm a runner. I've done some stuff in the Marine Corps. I've done a lot of different things. And I've been up and down the roads with wrestling companies since, like, 1998, going all over the place, uh, sleeping in cars, sleeping in hotels. I've had neck and back and knee problems for a lot of years. Uh, but Cairo One really helped me out. I didn't really have any preconceived notions about what a chiropractor can do. So I went in with an open mind. And these guys probably added about 10 years uh, to my running career, to my athletic career as a whole. Um, my neck and back problems, um, especially my knee problems, have definitely gone away. You know, I can do marathons and, and all sorts of runs like that without any pain. And it, it, it gave me back a lot of flexibility. It gave me, uh, you know, the flexibility I need 
to to go and stretch and not hurt myself, um, which is always a, a great thing, you know. Um, they're at Cairo1.net. I go to Cairo1 of the Loop 2, which is Dr. Ed. Um, so you can go and look him up. Um, you know, but it's a great place. It's uh, down, uh, if you're familiar with the downtown Chicago area, uh, they're at 175 West Jackson. Um, it's suite 21-something. Uh, uh, I go there about three or four times a week. Uh, good time, Dr. Ed and his staff. They're, they're really helpful. They know what they're doing. You know, just a plug for them, a little shout-out to them, because they've helped me heal and helped me get back some of the athleticism that I lost uh, due to various nagging injuries. And the reason I put them in this podcast is because, you know, wrestlers are always falling on their backs for a living, and they have back and neck and knee issues. And here's a situation where chiropractic, when you're out on the road and you're an active wrestler, you probably don't have a lot of time to be doing chiropractic. But once you're off the road, once you're retired, it might not be a bad idea to go and, and do some chiropractic go and check it out, see if it's good for you, see if it's a good fit. I generally tend to think it's a great fit. It's, it's done a lot of good for me. So check it out, uh, Cairo1.net. The, the office I go to is Cairo1 of the Loop 2. Um, we are on social media. We are on Facebook.com slash SFP Inc. Chicago. We are on SFP Inc. Chicago.com, our website. Please visit, check it out. Uh, it's not fully built out yet, uh, but, you know, we've got a library of over 10,000 items, so across different federations, a lot of different pay-per-views, a lot of different things, DVD, VHS, CDs, posters, all sorts of things. Um, I'd like to remind you of the Hitman Heart 10th Anniversary DVD set. It's a two-DVD set. It has the Hitman Heart film, and it also has the life and death of Owen Hart, uh, some great documentaries. We have, with it as an extra added bonus, we have, um, we have these lobby posters that hung in the lobbies of, you know, films, uh, uh, theaters in Canada when this film was actually put out initially in theaters. We have the classic poster, and we also have the 10th anniversary poster, the representations of, of the uh, DVD covers to both. So it's an extra added thing that will give you uh, $30 shipped, uh, anywhere in the U.S. So if you're interested in that, you know, send a question for ordering instructions to orders at sfpinkchicago.com. Um, if you have questions or comments or have something you want to address in the podcast, send an email to podcast at sfpinkchicago.com. If you want to go and talk about, uh, if you want to go and see Shannon Shea Marie, if you want to go and see Shannon Williams, Shannon Marie Williams, Shannon Shea Marie, if you want to go and see her in A Few Good Men, There Are No Good Men Because There Are No Good Women, or if you want to see her own Sugar and Spice web series that she's doing, you can go and check her out on Facebook at Shannon M. Soccer 10. She also has a Twitter. Uh, Twitter is, I believe, the same thing. Uh, Twitter.com slash Shannon uh, slash Shannon Soccer. Uh, excuse me. Get my notes straight here. I'm spinning on... In all these web addresses, I'm getting a little confused. Her Twitter is Shannon M10, and her Facebook is Shannon M10 Soccer. Oh wait, hold on. I got to do this again. Wait one moment here. Now I'm I'm confusing myself because you know there's all these uh, there's all these different things. So I'm getting confused. Her Twitter. One more time. Let's try this one more time, folks. I'm going to have half my broadcast dedicated to plugs. I can't get my plugs right. Um. Her Facebook is facebook.com slash Shannon M. Soccer 10. Or her, excuse me, her Facebook is, or her Twitter, rather, is Shannon M. 10. Her Facebook is facebook.com slash Shannon M. Soccer 10. Uh, you can see Shannon on the 31st of October at 7 or November 2nd and November 1st at, uh, at 3 p.m. at the Center Stage Theater. Uh, that's 1665 Quincy Avenue uh, in Naperville, Suite 131. That's Naperville, Illinois. Um, great play. And 
uh, you can see Shannon there, great actress. You know, if you go to the play, say hi, mention my name. She'd really love to hear from you. She, she's really excited about doing this. She's a really great actress, and, you know, I'd like it if you could go and support her. Uh, my friend Daniel Pewter, you can go and catch him, mylifemypower.org, and he's got all sorts of links to his social networking through there. Um, he is also on LinkedIn as well. Um, Kim Kimberly Cormican, KD Cormican, the book is Whatever Makes You Blind. You can follow her on Twitter at KimberlyC74. You can get the book Whatever Makes You Blind in paperback and Kindle at Amazon.com. So pick it up, shoot us a question at podcast at SFPInkChicago.com. Let us know what you thought of the book once you get it and once you've read it. Easy reading, about 225 pages. Not what you're expecting, so go and read the whole thing through. I think you'll find that it's a pretty engrossing book once you read it. Um, Cairo, one of the loop two. If you've got back problems, neck problems, go and check them out there. And um, I think you'll uh, you know, have a good time there, too. So thanks for listening one more time. Uh, I will see you very shortly. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading, sharing, um, streaming, everything. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. I will see you guys next broadcast. Thanks.